So uh, I'll make mine short and sweet because these guys pretty much talked about everything that I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to switch my speech up and talk about more about where we were and where we're going, and particularly from where I'm from in New Mexico, is uh, water. Um, we got here, I was super shocked that when you sit down at a restaurant, they give you water. Uh, in New Mexico, that doesn't happen. You, uh, you have to ask for water, they don't just give it to you. Um, so I'll kind of re-gear and kind of touch upon what we're doing, how the, ch the changes we made, because they've already talked about a lot of the stuff that I already wanted to. So this is our farm, uh, a picture of it. This is, um, we, we were a confinement operation, uh, like everyone else in our state. Um, average herd size in New Mexico is 2,600 cows for dairy operations. Um, there's not a lot of ranching that goes on. It's pretty much just confinement dairy. Um, so we were a confinement operation. We were milking about 400, 450 a head uh, two to three times a day. Um, and it was kind of go big or go home. So um, my dad kind of was, he didn't want to go in and invest more millions of dollars into more land and more operations. So he was going to retire. So then I decided, hey, I'm going to take over. But what happened is I just went ahead and wiped out all the pens and said, I'm going to turn the cows loose. And he told me I was going to bankrupt the farm. So, <laughs> and thus we're not poor yet. Um, so this is our milking facility. Um, we have a, a smaller facility compared to what everybody else has in, in our area. Um, we milk a, a variety of different cows, Holsteins, Jerseys, Guernseys. And uh, particularly right now, we're, we're only milking about 36 heads. So we went, we dramatically went down in numbers in order to be able to turn the cows loose and graze our property. We're growing, I think we can do somewhere around 80 to 100 head milking and continue to graze the entire farm. Um, this is our processing room. We went in, we had to revamp everything, uh, get up to new grade A standards um, to house our milk and to bottle it. And to create, um, we, we went into organic raw whole milk. Um, we are one of seven, I think there's nine states actually, that retail raw milk is legal to sell. Uh, we are one of those states. So uh, there is nobody doing grass fed. There is nobody uh, doing raw milk in our state. So we found a little niche market and we kind of jumped wholeheartedly into it. Um, so thus we turn grass into milk. Um, profit ratios for this. Um, Normal dairies had a great year last year. They're running around $23 to $25 a hundredweight. Um, we're, we're working on about $122 a hundredweight right now. So um, we can milk a lot less cows. So I, the way I like to view it is we are a low input, low output versus the confinement dairies in our, in our area are high, out, high, high input, high output. They're putting a lot of money in and getting a lot of milk out. We're not getting the milk production that they're getting. Um, we're actually probably about half of what they're getting, but our milk does have the increased value from what, where they're at. So we've, uh, we went into a lot of the cover cropping and a lot of different species, um, and we uh, started planting multi-species of stuff and letting the cows graze through it. Um, we bought a no-till planter. Um, thus again, my dad thought I was insane. He, we, had, we have a clay-based soil. He wanted to, we've been ripping and disking and leveling and doing all that two, three times a year every time we crop. Uh, the year that I took over, we were spending upwards on 125 acres, upwards of about $30,000 in fuel a year. Last year I spent 500. Um, we can whiz through that. You can put anything you want in. We have a three box planter. We can plant any kind of seeds. We can, um, uh, we don't have to till, we don't have to rip, and it leaves our soil intact. Um, prior to when my father was there and how I'm running things now, you couldn't get your finger and rub it into the soil. It was so hard and compact from the, the big machinery. We were pulling corn. We were on a corn on wheat rotation uh, and also alfalfa on every fifth year. Um, now we're going through, you can literally get some of our fields and you can just start sticking your hand down in the soil. The, the soil has been changing. And thus, my dad is starting to say, well, hmm. <laughs> you might be onto something. Um, so this is uh, one of our fields. I, I did, just two days ago, I ran out and snapped a shot of it. Um, everybody seems to be so scared of weeds. Um, I, I, I've actually learned how to work with weeds. We, we don't do pure crops anymore. So um, the weeds that come in between our rows, I don't worry about it. We turn the cows out. They graze weeds. Um, so particularly during the summer, we get the summer slump. Our crops are much, uh, you know, they're not growing as well. They're not, they don't have the protein. They don't have the energy levels. 
Um, so I s started watching my cows. And as you watch animals, they kind of do what's natural to them. So when we turn them onto a field or a paddock, they would run around the edges eating pigweed. Pigweed is nasty weed, particularly if you're gonna be haying. But they loved it. They were going around eating pigweed. Then they'd come back around and eat the, the, the Johnson grass or the, um, the, the tumbleweeds, uh, kochia. Um, all these different things they're eating prior to going into a fresh field of alfalfa and Sudan grass and all these great things that I thought they would eat first, they didn't. They went around the perimeter and ate weeds and then went to the crops. So then, of course, I went to my dad and said, what's wrong with my cows? Something, <laughs> something ain't right here. They're eating weeds, particularly pigweed. Um, so I went and did research. Um, pigweed, it's like 22% uh, protein in the tips of the, of the, uh, of the weed. Uh, kosher weed is, they call it the poor man's alfalfa. They're, um, they're, it's, it's right around 18. So, I mean, even some of the premium alfalfas aren't having the protein levels that just weeds have. And the great thing for us, because we're having diminishing water, we, we, uh, we water through ditches, so we've, we, they dam up the rivers and reservoirs up north from us. They bring it down the rivers. We dam it up through our check, and it goes out to the field uh, for flood irrigation. Um, this is getting less and less. Our average rainfall normally is around eight, eight and a half inches of rain a year. We're down to about four inches for the past four or five years. So all of our reservoirs are diminishing. We used to be able to call what we call a ditch rider, the person that manages this water for us, and say, hey, we need water. Um, this is the crops we're going in. It doesn't work like that anymore. They call us and say, he actually just called me right before I went on. I can see him buzzing me. Um, they tell you now you're going to have water tonight and you get it for this much time, take it or lose it, and then you got another 21 day cycle, 21 day to 30 cycle before you get water back. Um, it doesn't rain in New Mexico. Um, that's why when it starts raining here, me and my wife went out and stood in the rain. Um, people thought we were crazy, but we just never see it. So um, thus, these weeds that we were just discussing, um, the kosher weed, the tumbleweeds, uh, all they need is three to four inches of water a year to grow. Well, we get that in precipitation. So if I can utilize weeds that literally grow with no water is where we're kind of looking for our future. We still need cash crops. We still need to be able to uh, plant in different types with those weeds, but I've actually been planting forage kosher. We've been actually planting a little bit of pigweed, doing these things in order to, uh, to get the cows to eat them, and they love it. The milk production shot up. We had no problem in milk production. Um, the cows have been going good. This is the ditch. This is one of our cement ditches that flood irrigate our property. Um, and we go through many things because our water is so limited. Uh, we try to utilize every drop of water that we possibly can get. So we use, we utilize um, uh, laser leveling. We go through and every 100 feet we drop an inch to two inches of uh, depth. And so the water comes in on one side and it has a, a way to flow. The more efficient that we can water the uh, the better off we can utilize that with the, the limited amounts of water that we actually have. Um, this is some of the, the weed fields. This is Johnson grass and alfalfa in the bottom and oats and I mean you name it, it's, it's growing. We just kind of let it, we've been doing a bunch of different experimental fields to see what happens, see what milk production is up or down. Um, and it's kind of funny when you let nature take its course when we just started, we planted some of the stuff and then watered and let the weeds come through. Um, and it, <clears throat> the diversity in those weeds is amazing. We'll get, we got millet grass and Johnson grasses, and um, you know we already had alfalfa in the field, but you're getting a whole variety of stuff. The cows are going out there and just mowing it down to literally nothing. And you water it again, and or sometimes don't even water it, and the Johnson grass is shooting up. Everything is coming up. So we are planting strictly for water consumption. Um, these are different things we're looking into. This is the side of our creamery and the milking parlor. We're getting, this is just native grasses. Uh, hopefully you can tell me what that is. I don't know. We're gonna let us seed out and figure out what it is. This was just two days ago at my farm before we flew up here. Uh, this stuff is growing on the side of our buildings. If I could get my field to look like this two months prior to my grazing season, that extends us up. I mean, this stuff's been coming up for, as soon as it warms up, it sprouts up and then when it snows or frosts, it kind of goes down. Then it comes right back up as soon as the sun's out. That's the types of stuff we're looking to, to plant. Um, not even our NRCS people, they, you know, I got them over there every day going, what is this and what is that? And that's what I want to plant. And they're like, you can't find this seed. So we're going to figure out how to get that kind of growth in our fields this early. Um, 
This is a field of kosher, kind of a terrible picture. I'm a, I milk cows, I don't take pictures. Um, so uh, you can see in the very bottom of the picture, um, that's, that's kosher coming up, uh, tumbleweeds with some whatever grass that decided to grow. We're getting a bunch of uh, other different types of uh, grasses growing right now. Um, so all that kosher is coming up. This is an entire field of kosher. This is what it looked like last year. This is also a problematic field. This particular field that these cows are in right now is where my, my grandfather housed cows, my dad housed cows, and it's where I tore all the pens out. So this was under 300 cows, this little two and a half acres for dang near 45, 50 years. Um, so we're having a bunch of trouble trying to get anything to grow. So we went in, we ripped it really deep, we plowed it, we turned it over, and I planted kochia in it, and the kochia's coming in great, and the cows love it. The uh, milk production shot up, they have no problem. Uh, this field has never, never been watered. I've never, I have no access to get water to it, so it's never been, it's never been watered. And it's growing more prolifically than any of my other fields. Um, so we turned it on there, we turned the cows loose on, on this kochia field for a few times a, a year, let them graze it all off, and then we go on to our more production crops. Um, this is a permanent pasture we have in. When I, as soon as I get home, you can see the cows on the very top of the picture. Um, they're in a, a couple bare fields, so all the way up to the top right of the picture, you can see there's a ryegrass field planted over there. I had a few slides, but I felt like that was just too much. So I pulled them back out, but that's my ryegrass field. The other two fields we, uh, we, we run through, we do uh, soil samples. Um, they were lacking in nitrogen, so I left them we, we had pearl millet in it. I just didn't plant anything back into it. We let the cows run out there for the full season. And uh, we've just been flopping them in a mob grazing situation over the field, um, just letting them um, poop and pee as be. That way we get the nitrogen back in the ground. As soon as I get home, we'll, uh, we'll go out there and no-till in oats, uh, probably a little bit of hairy vetch, a couple other different varieties, um, and um, get that growing as they move on to this field. And from here, this is uh, a variety of like seven different crops. Uh, there's alfalfa, there's orchard grass, rye grasses, brome grasses. The brome grass is the brown that's inside, which uh, is actually pulling my yield down. We felt like we could have a full season uh, pasture, but it's, uh, it's, it's not putting out the yield that I wanted to put out this early on. So what we're gonna do is we'll, I'll turn the cows loose, let them uh, graze down all of this orchard grass, and then we'll come in with the same, uh, with our no-tiller and we'll run in and, and plant oats and, and uh, a bunch of different varieties to fill up all those gaps just to keep something growing at all times. Um, this is our sedan grass field from last year. This is, uh, we had a little bit of undergrowth. We overplanted, I feel like, on the sedan grass, so a lot of the other uh, crops that we put in didn't uh, come through. But uh, we try to get this kind of cover all of the time. Um, because it keeps the ground moist. We, everybody in our valley is irrigating right now, and we're not. Um, I went out to my fields, and it's, I, could, I could dig an inch down and squeeze that field, and it's, it's pure mud, whereas everybody else that's been, had any tillage in the last year is already irrigating as we speak. My fields just couldn't hold any more water, so we turned the water away. So the frustrating part for us is um, with that lack of water, it's the lack of education that people are having to be able to utilize the water in our area much better. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that and 